Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the start of Holy Week. Um, and we want to speak this morning a prophetic message into the heart of our city. This morning is, or this Holy Week that starts with Palm Sunday, moves to Good Friday, Waiting Saturday, Easter Sunday, the whole entire week. I want you to know that it is significantly personal. It in, in, impacts your story. It touches your heart. It moves on you. But what happened this week, church, is not just significantly personal. It is seismic in scope in terms of what God is doing. So I want you to turn to the person beside you and say, it includes you, but it's not all about you. <laughs> it includes you. It includes your story. But it's not all about you. There's a grander thing that Jesus is doing, and it's an incredible thing. You know, Jesus does profound work when he is placed in between. Crucified between two criminals, Jesus does a profound work. Wedged between what's always been and what is to come, Jesus did a profound work. Walking between two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus did a profound work. Sandwiched between the old covenant and a new covenant, that was him, he did a profound work. Jesus always does a profound work when placed in between. You know, every time, every time we celebrate communion, which we did last Sunday, which we will do on Good Friday, every time we celebrate communion and we read the words that this is my body that was broken for you or this is my blood that was shed for you, I am always so reminded that Jesus echoed those words in between betrayal and denial. That's what he did. He bent down and washed his disciples' feet in between their betraying him and denying him. He served. Jesus does profound work when placed in between. Christopher Wright says, so the words that Jesus speaks again about bread and wine are surrounded on one side by the words of betrayal and on the other side, denial. And so as in our culture today, we have always been and we are continuing to wrestle with the fundamental challenge of our culture today, whether our heart breaks or what we see in Syria this week. I mean, it breaks in half to what it is that we see in different levels and stages all around us. Jesus does profound work when placed in between. So today we want to we wanna stand in the central struggle, the, the place of contention in our culture between equality and inequality, between haves and have-nots, between those who are winning and those who are stepping on the backs of others in order to win. We want to stand in this place and see what Palm Sunday, see what the gospel has to say. One of the questions, I think, when we look at our world and we look at the brokenness, and how many of you know that from Sunday to Sunday, anything can happen? This week as a church, we are grieving with and praying for the Ogun Remy family who lost, Toju lost her mother last Sunday, who got up as she does every Sunday to go to church and hopped in a taxi on her way to church. There was an accident and she lost her life. And so this morning we are praying for Toju and for Delhi and for Samuel and for Doi and we are praying for the entire Rogan Remy family. Because from Sunday to Sunday, your eternity hangs in the balance. So again, what Jesus is doing this morning is it's personal, but it's seismic as well. How did our culture get here? How do we get out of here? What does it look like? Well, I want to take you to the book of Genesis. The very first chapter, the very first opening pages of Scripture. And it says, so God created man in his own image, humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male. Everyone say male and female. Yes. Not just male. Usually, usually you did the way. <laughs> so God created him in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. Everyone say imago Dei. You are created in the image of God with inherent worth, inherent value, inherent dignity, that the people that you agree with are created in the image of God. The people that you disagree with are created in the image of God. So when we transgress one another, we're not only doing something personal, we're transgressing, the Im or transgressing against this heart, this image bearer of who God is. And so Jesus creates us in equality. Everyone say equality. 
not in equality. Jesus creates us in his image, in this place of equality. How beautiful is this picture of humanity? Each life has inherent worth and value and dignity. It is the struggle of our culture to have this. Each life has the right to life because each life is created in the image and likeness of God. To destroy one image is to mar the full beauty of God on the earth. Now I want to pull you to the other side of Scripture. So there's Genesis. We see that this beautiful picture of Imago Dei, that we are all created in the image and likeness of God, every single one of us. But here you might go, well, that's not very difficult. That's like two people. Like there's... There's conflict, but there's only two people, right? Now I want to put, are you alive this morning? Are you okay? I want to pull you to Revelation on the other side of it. And as I was reading this a few weeks ago, in particular on Palm Sunday, I saw something that I had just never seen before. It says, after this I looked. So here's John. He's a revelation of what heaven looks like. He says, after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. Come on. Heaven ain't small. A great multitude that no one can number. From every nation, all tribes, peoples, and languages were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's Jesus, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Palm Sunday. Now that's a Palm Sunday right here. With palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation. What? Salvation. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb and to the angels who were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, so be it. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might belong to our God forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I heard a preacher once say, and once you get to the end of the ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So this is intensely, intensely personal, but it is seismic in scope that what, to what God is doing. Easter week is not just about you. He took the th- fall and he thought of me above all. No, you are included in it, but it's not just about you. It is about redeeming everything that is lost, everything that is broken, all the things that we see. He took the fall and he thought of Syria. He took the fall and thought of all of it to redeem all brokenness to himself. Everything that isn't can be redeemed in King Jesus. So what do we, I will, what do we see in this revelation, this, this wisdom, this glimpse of heaven? What's your viewpoint of heaven? Are we these ambiguous souls sitting on clouds, playing harps, and having to eat Philadelphia cream cheese? <laughs> is that what heaven is? Well, heaven's going to be a good golf course. Really, a good golf course, that's your ideal heaven. Some of you are like, yeah, it is. Really? Wow. What's your, what's your idea of heaven? You know, you know what I love about when John sees heaven? He sees a revelation of what it is. You know what he doesn't see? He doesn't see all white people. He doesn't just see black people or Asian or Hispanic. He sees every nation, every tribe, every kindred, every come. We, we, we don't all just become these homogenous nothings. We see the diversity of humanity redeemed in Jesus. We're going to keep going. We, see, we don't see a single gender. We see both. We see, what we see, though, is the fully restored, redeemed Imago Dei of humanity. We see diversity living in harmony and not hostility one with another. We see those who have allowed Jesus to be the Savior of your life. We see those who are Jewish who have allowed Jesus to be the Savior of their life. We see those who are Palestinian have allowed Jesus to be the Savior of their life. We see them standing not divided by a border, but arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, standing together, saying salvation belongs to our God. All blessing and glory and honor and power belongs to Him. We don't see this group in that group. We don't see uh, English and French divide. We see united together under King Jesus. 
Church Palm Sunday, the Holy Week, what we move into, this is not small. It is significant for you, but it is seismic in terms of what God is doing. As we just began to sing, Hosanna, break my heart for the things that break yours, but open up my eyes to see the global work that you're doing, the scale at which you're moving. We see every nation. Every nation means every single culture. We see every single culture Jesus, when you give your life to Jesus, he doesn't set you free from your culture. He sets you free from things in your culture that do not reflect who he is. But you don't have to give up who you are. Again, when we give our hearts to Jesus, we don't all become white or black or this or that. We remain who we are. He has ordained praise from every nation, every culture, every tribe, every family, every kin on planet Earth, every people, every geographical grouping of people, every single language. John sees every language being uttered in heaven. Not one official language. Not even to. Every language is uttered unto who the king is. Oh my goodness, what a picture. All of this speaks again. When you look in heaven, when you see this glimpse of heaven, you see that we all pick up these palm branches and begin to say, Hosanna to the king and all blessing. When you see, get a glimpse of heaven, again, you still see difference. But you see difference and a sense of belonging a sense of home, a sense of community. Difference is not removed in heaven. It is fully redeemed, and difference no longer leads to division. It no longer leads to us fighting one another. That is all gone. Every tear is wiped. All those things that you read about in Revelation, it's beautiful. What a picture. And again, as I've highlighted a few times, did you notice what they had in their hands? Palm branches. So on the one hand of Genesis, we have the Imago Dei. On the other hand, I'm doing my best to paint a picture of everything in our hearts that we long for. What does our world long for today? It longs for equality. Equality. That our differences would not divide us. That we would be united under this space. We would be united together. And we are wrestling. We are wrestling. And there's the left that feels that they have the solution to the problem, and there's those on the right that feel that they have the solution to the problem. I may talk about things that are political today, but I'm not making a political speech today. I'm talking about things that are affecting the world in which you and I live in. You can't pick up a palm without putting down a position. There's something about holding a position and holding a palm that just doesn't work. Because when Jesus, as we're going to see in a minute, in heaven, when they pick up these palms, there's no position. It's no longer, I'm against you. It is that we, have, we are united and that we needed salvation. And so we pick up palms and we wave and we worship from this place of we were bankrupt without him. It is a thing that we all share equally, created in the image of God, but sin breaks us equally. Need of redemption the cry in our culture for tolerance. The cry in our culture for tolerance is this deep longing for heaven. Church, every time you hear tolerance, I want you to start to hear it differently from, maybe you've already heard it this way, and if you're ahead of the curve, you are awesome. But every time you hear the word tolerance, I want you to hear that there is a cry, a longing for what we're reading about in Revelation. It's what everybody wants, what is the one thing we want? Peace on earth. There's this deep cry for tolerance. It's a deep longing for heaven. But there's a problem between Genesis, between the beauty of being created in the Imago Dei, the image of God, and the hope rising in our souls element of heaven, there's a problem in between. Between Genesis and Revelation, there are problems. Between this heart and this hope, there are problems. It is in this space that there was something called a fall. And in this fall, there is a repetitive cycle of sin where for one group to gain, another group's got to lose. 
and we see it played over and over and over and over and over again all through the centuries. And the left can be in power and one group gains and one group loses. And then the right comes to power and one group gains and one group loses. And over and over and over and over again, information is good. But if information alone could save us, we would be saved because we've got a lot of it. We got a lot of it. I mean, the Google is powerful. I heard a comedian say, and I thought it was really funny, like, if you're growing up today and you're in school, you don't really have excuse not to get your homework done because the Google has the answer to every question. <laughs> As a parent, it's a godsend. When kids bring home the math and they're, Dad, what's X? And I'm like, again, kids, when, when, when letters and numbers uh, are in math, your dad just goes, go see your mother. <laughs> but if you throw it into the Google, guess what? The Google knows what it is. Has anyone here ever typed into Google and you actually missed, like you, you, you didn't type the right thing and Google said, I thought you meant, and Google was right? <laughs> you just slam your computer down, you break it and you have, you burn it, light it on fire, that's demons right there, that's, I don't know what that is, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good. It's crazy. Come on. If information alone could save us. But information is actually driving us further apart. Because now you can live in a world where you actually don't have to change because you've got 9,743 million articles that affirm your position. And guess what? They have 9,000, whatever number I just said, numbers to affirm their position. So again, it's the same cycle we see. We live divided. We live shouting at one another. We live opposed. In the fall, we need a new king. We keep electing other kings. We keep hoping other things are going to save us. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus... You know that this is true because you see it repeated over and over and over again. If education is a good thing, it's a wonderful thing, it's a blessed thing, it's an incredible thing, but if it was enough to save us, we would be saved. If goodness was enough to save us, there's a lot. How many in the world today, there's a lot more good than there is bad? But it's not just good and evil. It's we need something else. You know, sin... It wants the fruit of the kingdom, but it doesn't want the king. We want to be like God without God. That's what sin does. And to mend this brokenness, culture always wrestles with opposing philosophies. So on the right, we have a national movement now. You can see it in the States that stands up for some, but not others. And on the left, we have a cultural movement which stands up for some, but if you're not in that view, it doesn't stand up for you, for not others. Take a deep breath, everyone, please. On one side, believes a woman right to choose has greater priority over the life of her child or unborn child in her womb. But both are created in the Imago Dei, that God doesn't just see one life, he sees two. And his heart is to redeem all of it. It's hardest to redeem all of it. One side believes more in economic prosperity than it does human flourishing. And God needs to move into these spaces. Both sides, though, claim tolerance as a virtue, as long as tolerance advances their position. Both sides see the replay as the fall is in Genesis chapter 4 between Cain and his brother Abel, where to protect our right to worship as we see fit, we destroy what is different or makes us feel inferior. What we don't agree with. The pursuit of peace in the world in which we live is not only selecting, its side, uh, selecting a side, it is surrendering to a savior. So my question for you this morning is, who are you surrendering to? Who are you surrendering to save your life, to redeem your family for the world in which your children will inherit? Where is our hope rising? What is it rising in? I'm not saying that earthly things aren't good things, they're wonderful things, they're beautiful things.
But history has shown us time and time and time and time and time and time again that there is no side that can be our Savior. Each side to varying degrees can make something better but cannot heal brokenness. That we can throw money at poverty but we can't heal the heart of it. We can't go to the root of it. That we can work hard as we should at areas of inequality, whether it be racism, sexism, wherever it is. We can work hard and those things need to be redeemed. And everything that we can have with the gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given us, we can engage those things. But God alone outside of this has to heal the human heart or the cycle continues over and over and over again. Again, while each side can offer us something, each side can't save us. So what we see on Holy Week, between the Imago Dei text of Genesis and the all difference united together, every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue of revelation and the hope of revelation between the heart of God in Genesis and the hope of revelation, we have Jesus in the space between, placed between in this space. Because we needed a Savior who wasn't on a side, who was outside to come inside relationship with humanity and to begin to move in our hearts. Church, if you're here today and again you don't know Jesus, it's not just a left or a right issue. You need a third option. You need someone from the outside to redeem what's broken on the inside. You know, what's amazing about Jesus is he's no respecter of persons. That wherever Jesus is placed in the space between, he does profound work. Sometimes it is the beauty of grace, and other times it's the offense of grace. That there are some in our lives, there are some that we see in culture that we go, well, they're worthy of forgiveness, they're worthy of grace, they're worthy of this. And then we think, and again, we look at Syria, we look at different things, and we go, well, the, the person who perpetrated, no, no. Just no. Our hearts are so bruised. There is this beauty of grace. And church, come on, there's an offense of it too. That he's no respecter of persons. That anyone who calls out on the name of the Lord, that he's as close as the mention of his name. Imagine, I want to take you to the foot of the cross and I want you to see Jesus crucified between two criminals. One on his left and one on his right, Dismas and Gestus. Both criminals, they, what they're being crucified for, they did. Which means that whatever they did, those in the crowd are there watching because they're the ones that did it. And the offense of one railing at Jesus. You can be so close to Jesus, but you can't see who he is. Sin can blind our heart. And then you have the other on the other side who just says, remember me. When you enter paradise, not even save me. I'm not even worthy of it. I'm, not, I'm guilty. I mean, I did what I'm hanging, what I'm dying for. I did this. I did it. I am paying for what I've done. But would you just remember me? Would you just be gracious to me? Would you, would you remember me? And what does Jesus say to him? Today, today, you're going to be with me in what? In paradise. I think it's beautiful, but imagine the earshot of the crowd of the one going, excuse me. Excuse me. Because when we... Admit we need a Savior, we give up our right to judge because He alone is holy. The hope of the resurrection is the heart of heaven. And under King Jesus, we see something profound. Enter Genesis, heart, revelation, hope, enter. Palm Sunday. Matthew 21, verses 1 to 3, 6 to 11. It says, Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, 
and immediately you'll find a donkey and a colt with her. This is just a good moment here to say, turn to the person beside you and say, if, if Jesus c- can use a donkey, he, he, can, he can use you. <laughs> that joke never gets old. If, if, if you're here for 30 more years, yeah, it's coming again every Easter. <laughs> like clockwork. And tie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them. And he will send them at once. And most of them, most of the crowd, this is now verse 8 to 11. Most of the crowd. Everyone say most of the crowd. Not everyone. Because you can be close and you can miss it. But most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road. And others began to cut branches from trees. And spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him, that followed him, were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the what? Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, it says the whole city was stirred up saying, here's the question, who is this? Who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. It's one thing to see Jesus as a prophet. It's another thing to see him as the son of God. But this is the central question, isn't it? Who is Jesus? Who is this? How do you place Jesus in between for your life? You have to answer who he is. You have to answer who he is. Who is Jesus to you? Is he a good teacher? Because if he's just a good teacher, then you can place Jesus alongside Buddha. You can put him alongside Hinduism. You can put him alongside of anything you want. And he's just a good teacher. If Jesus was just very, very compassionate, then you can put him right alongside Mahatma Gandhi, who was also incredibly compassionate. If Jesus was only a martyr, then you can put him with the other martyrs who have given their lives for what they believed in. But if Jesus was who he said he was, if Jesus is the one who was present with his father in Genesis, with the Imago Dei, if he was present in the beginning, if he saw the brokenness of the fall, if he was with his father as they sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet, and they made advances, but the cycle of brokenness continued until one day this Jesus was placed in between earth and heaven heart and hope, perfection, perfection, fall and brokenness, Jesus is placed. And into this city of Jerusalem, he begins to ride. Into this space, he begins to show up. This king, Jesus, does not show up in a chariot made of gold. This Jesus didn't show up in a palace. This Jesus showed up in the most lowly form of a child from his earliest existence, struggle to survival. This Jesus comes in fulfilling prophecy, riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. And the city is stirred. And as the community begins to look at him, they begin to say, well, who is this? And it's the central question of Easter The people wanted salvation, but they also wanted success, which means that they wanted the Messiah to march into the city and do hard business with Rome. They wanted to be free from Gentile oppression, even if by force, even if by threats and plagues and a splitting of a sea, they wanted their history recounted. They wanted another Moses, but what they were getting is one that is greater than Moses. 
They wanted another exodus, only they didn't know that Jesus came to set them free, not only from the Romans, but from the very thing that ruled them, which was the brokenness of their own heart. That you can replace the Romans, you can be set free from the Romans, and find yourself enslaved to another king. Instead, what they got by Friday morning from their perspective was another disappointment. A bloodied has-been, a man in Roman custody, rejected by their own leaders, standing next to an infamous criminal named Barabbas. They wanted an uncomparable king, but all they could see in this moment was a beaten blasphemer. But this bloodied and beaten, there's a lot of B words right there, blasphemer was a king doing for us doing something for his kingdom to flourish on earth as it is in heaven. Are you with me? On earth. What did he pray? On earth as it is in heaven. What is the solution? What is the heart cry of our culture? It is for equality amongst every single one of us. We won't have it until King Jesus is Lord of all. Until we answer who he is and place him in this space. King Jesus looks to the left and says, you need saving. King Jesus looks to the right and says, you need saving. And between the Palm Sunday Hosanna and heaven's hope for every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue, Jesus did for us what we cannot do on our own. So I'm going to invite you as a response this morning. No, we do not have palm branches for you, but you do have palms with you. And I'm going to invite you to take a moment in a place of worship and lift your heart and open your heart to Jesus and say, God, I will place you in between where I am and where I want to be. I'm going to place you in between the brokenness of what is, the disappointment of what is, the hurt of what is, the devastation of what is, the hope of what I desire, the hope of humanity. One of the things I'm most proud of when I look at Life Center is it's every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue. I'm I'm unapologetic. The worst testimony to the heart of heaven is a racially divided church. Church should look like on earth as it is in heaven. It should look like rich and poor, free and addict, those who are absolutely you know, set free in Jesus and those who need to be set free in Jesus. The church is not a country club for a community. It's a hospital for a lost and broken city. And the hope of Jesus is that every single one of us could say, God, we are in need of you to save us. King of glory, would you come in? So before we all get to all blessing and honor and glory and power, we have to get to Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, not just here and not just here. Some of you are good with Hosanna, but what Jesus is asking for is, will you let him be King Jesus of your heart? Hosanna in the highest. I'm going to invite you to stand together as we sing Hosanna and take your palms and let's worship Jesus together this morning.